Welcome once again to Red All Over YouTube. I'm Graham Mack, and this is the YouTube version of this. Red All Over the Land, the Liverpool fanzine, which for 26 years, is it now, John? Am I, am heading I keeping it? Heading to 27. Heading to 27 years as yeah. the longest running and the only surviving Liverpool printed fanzine. And the editor is John Pierman. How are you, John? I'm not too bad, Graham. How are you? Yeah, good. And uh, on today's show, we're going to be reminiscing. How many weeks ago was it now? Was it about two about and a half four. weeks ago? Four weeks. Four. Wow, time's flown. Yeah. About four weeks ago, we had the, the privilege to be in the company of a true Liverpool legend, Ian Callaghan, who has the record for the most games, but we'll find out all about that. We recorded a piece with him in Southport, and that's coming up a little bit later on. Also, legendary broadcaster John Keith, who made this all happen, uh, he's in it too. So we had a good chat with him. So that's coming up on this version of Red All Over YouTube. So we'll get to that in a bit. But I suppose, John, we should talk about last season, shouldn't we? Well, it's a, it's a good place to start, isn't it? Um, what a season. You, you yeah. know, um, I know how it, we know how it ended, but that was uh, down to... Um, the situation at uh, the Etihad, we needed Man City to drop points. They didn't. We yeah. could do nothing about that. You can't influence that. And, of course, we came up against a goalkeeper in an inspired form in, uh, in Paris. Yeah. And um, I actually think in Paris we'll possibly fatigue or fatigue took over as well because there was a lot of things about our game that didn't look right. And it, it wasn't just the fact that the... Uh, coach of um, Real Madrid and Ch Carlo Ancelotti is a genius um, yeah. and strangely enough the only club he couldn't uh, win anything with was Everton um, <laughs> yes. I don't know why even he gave up you know, yeah. Yeah, you know so uh, yeah we, we got beat but um, you, you know if you'd have said to anybody anybody at the start of last season you'll win you'll win two trophies and the other two tr uh, competitions that you're involved in you'll be involved until the final whistle, not not yeah. nothing, uh, nothing else. The final whistle, you yeah. know, because Villa could, uh, wish they could have done anyway, could have got that last minute goal that would have turned it all on its head, but they didn't, um, and uh, we could have equalised against Real Madrid, but we didn't. So we were involved right up until the very final whistle in all competitions, and that's some that takes some doing. Do you think in the end, particularly with the European Cup? it was because we were involved in so many competitions that made the difference, like it was a game too far. Yes, but it's a, what a game too far to have. You you know, um, you if you reach a cup final, no matter what the cup final is, it could be one that you play on, in on a Sunday morning. If you get beat, you're disappointed. But the thing is, first of all, to be disappointed, you have to reach that final. And we reached three cup finals. Um it was amazing. You you know, no team, no team um, in the history of football has achieved what that team achieved last season. On that respect, you know, you know, every competing for every trophy till the last and, minute. Yeah, 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 right. Yeah. yeah, to the last kick, to the last whistle. Yeah. yeah. So that that was fantastic, and also, um, you you know, look at the number of games we played. I mean, I'll just browsing over some stats the other day, I don't know why, but 90 games more than Everton. How many more, John? 19, you're, you're games. 19 games more than Everton, yeah. yeah. 19 games more than Everton. And we played 20 more than some of the other teams in the Premier Division. Now, that constitute that's half a season. You, <laughs> you know, their players were packing the bags and going on holiday. We, we didn't get that opportunity. I mean, you, yeah. you know, it's to play that many games... Plus, throw in the international matches that um, the players were forced to play. Um, yes. And, you know, it just takes it to another level. It, amazing. Absolutely amazing. And I've got... if uh, The only regret I've got is we didn't win everything, but that was that's not anybody's fault. And yeah. there's no disappointment. It was just yeah. what we achieved last season, to me, was fantastic. And how important and the, was it that we won both domestic cups well in my eyes 
uh, you look at some of the greatest players in the game, and talk, let's talk in just English players now, not um, not Irish, Scottish, or anything like that. English players. If if you are a professional footballer, you want to win all your domestic trophies, and for Trent Alexander Arnold and Jordan Henderson, now they've played in two cup, two domestic cups and won them both. So they on their CV now. They ticked all boxes. That that's their that's that that's it. If they retired tomorrow, they've got they've got careers. They've got they've won every medal open to them, and that's something else. That's special. Mm. And you you know um, Stephen Gerrard didn't do that. There are other players that haven't done that. But these players, they've, they've achieved every single medal. That they, they've won every single medal open to them. That's yeah. special. Yeah, and that's why the homecoming parade was such a big deal. Well, that, that um, I, I arrived in Liverpool, I think it was around half past 11, and I thought there's not going to be too many here. And you walked around and the, you could sense there was a bit of flatness in the air. It was understandable. Um, people were walking around bleary-eyed. Some of them were uh, been on a part to the parties, the hem parties and the stag do's, but... A lot of them were the football fans, and you could tell. Um, but then I walked down to the Strand, where I decided I was going to stand and watch it on the gates outside the Albert Dock, where I stood for the uh, the last homecoming. And you looked around you, and you, you couldn't, you, you felt that it wasn't quite right. And then I walked into the Albert Dock, and everywhere was fully full. All the restaurants, the bars, the sh everything, even the cafe, they're all full. And it was a case of people were waiting. It wasn't. It wasn't a tremendously warm day either. So, you you know, people keeping themselves around out of the way. And then, the news came that the t uh, team had started the parade um, up at, at uh, near near Five Ways, and yeah, you, suddenly the there was a sense of something be started to begin uh, to to come up, sweep over the place, and. Um, what amazed me was the number of people from overseas that were there. Yes, they'd come into Liverpool to watch the game, but they still stayed to see them come home. There were people that travelled on the day from all parts of um, England and, and, and possibly Scotland as well, and they'd come just to see the parade. There were people on the trains that were coming in from Wales. You you know, there was it was amazing just to see it and uh, and feel it. It, it was fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. And then got to around half past six and the Strand, it was no different to the day we won the trophy, brought the cup home. Um, it was fantastic. You you know, they estimated half a million people, half a million people to see a team that had missed out on the biggest comp trophy in the, in the in world football, maybe. But yeah, yeah and, and that's top, said something. And walking back to um, Central Station, after the parade, people were in huge groups, and I just stood there and I just thought, "This is amazing." They're all singing, dancing, you know, <laughs> chanting, and every flags were flying, and it was it brilliant. I got to the station, I, I saw a police officer, and uh, I went and asked him what it'd been like, and he said that he had, they, they'd estimated that over that whole weekend, there was over one, there was one million people plus in Liverpool. That's wow. a hell of a number, a hell of a yeah. number. And I tell you, probably won't find one bar owner or restaurant owner that were disappointed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that, that something was else. Fantastic. And fantastic. so it was a hell of a season, and you have to go back a long way to find a season that had that kind of vibe to it. I was thinking 77, maybe, when we just missed out on the treble. Yeah, yeah. Two thousand and one was pretty good because we play we played um, sixty three games that season. But uh, yeah. you, you know that that was another good season. Played in every played um, every game open to us that season. So we've done it twice. Yeah, yeah it's fantastic. But uh, but this year I don't know. It felt like something different. These are new players, new heroes, new legends. Yeah, um, there's a lot of hope, yeah. isn't there? Because of, there's because... a lot of hope. Yeah, 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 and that we goes a long way. Two, we had hope in two thousand and one, but um, we never kicked on from that uh, that team. Uh, obviously, yeah. Gerald Houllier's illness contributed to it, but 
we never kicked on. The, the, the club didn't kick on. But this yeah. this this club under these owners, um, yes, they've made mistakes, but they're keeping us on the right track. Um, looking forward to next season. We'll talk about later. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. You you know the the future is the future is uh, red. If, if there was only one, if there's one low point really in the season, and that would be, you know, what happened in Paris with the fans, and we shouldn't be dwelling on that, but there's a lot of it in the in the next fanzine. You've got the facts from the fans' perspective, haven't you? Yeah, um, a lot of the people that write for the fanzine, write in the fanzine, went over and they sent their contributions, and um, some of them, uh, a few of them, didn't have tickets, so they actually went to watch the games either in the fa at the fan park or in local bars. And uh, they've been made welcome by the bar owners, obviously, they were taking money. Um, uh, and yeah, they, they all concentrated on the positives, which was how well behaved the Liverpool fans were uh, yeah. and how they enjoyed everything apart from the police, which was yeah. disgraceful. And, you, yeah. know, you know, no other word for it. And the fact that... There's been very little condemnation from within the powers of the in this country. The the FA, the Premier League, um, the government. You you know before before Glasgow Rangers went off to play um, uh, Frankfurt in their their uh, cup final in Seville, Boris Johnson stood up in the House of Commons and said, um, "We I speak for both sides of all sides of the house when we wish Glasgow Rangers." All the best for tonight. Never said a word about Liverpool. No. You know, you, you know. So, and that to me is, is another thing. But we're not going to dwell on that. We yeah. we, we had a great side, great team, great season, and you you know, I can honestly say I think the vast majority of fans enjoyed every single minute of it. Yeah, every yeah. single minute. What and and tell you, we had some celebrations right up until <laughs> even on the the final night after we have not won the league. We still had a big celebration uh, up in Liverpool um, uh, at the pillbox area, uh, and great, absolutely brilliant, brilliant. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll talk about hope and looking forward to this season. We got some new signings to talk about. There's players left. There's the the development of Anfield, the continuing development of Anfield. But we'll get to that after this special. This thing that we we filmed, uh, it, it was in Southport, John. It was at the new hideaway. How did this hideout. all come together? Uh, what the did hideout. I say? The hideout. <laughs> the new yeah. hideout in Southport. God, he's yeah. going to kill me now. The, blo it was, the blocks, it was the blocks name's away. yes, it was. the The bloke's name is Jimmy Hill, but he's not that Jimmy Hill, is he? He's a, he's no, a good bloke. He really looked after us. There's some great people there. The new hideout in Southport, and of course, John Keith was who, who we got to put this together. How did it all come together then, John? You've known John Keith well, for a while. Well, the idea initially was that John was going to um, uh, put something on at the new Brighton Pavilion. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. It, it didn't happen. Um, you you know, with people coming out of COVID, there were still people not buying tickets, the economic situation and, and, uh, and all that. So I spoke to him and I said, is there anywhere else we can go and just do a, something more um intimate if you like certainly informal and he said he got this place in southport so he he introduced me to uh, the owner and then and john set it all up um and it was going to be for a small gathering of people downstairs and meanwhile we would be upstairs earlier on filming our own um interview with both john and ian callahan and it, it went, I, I think it went extremely well. And um, what a man Ian Callahan is, you know, and some of them stories were fantastic. And there's a, there is a piece in there that nobody actually knew about um, that would have regarded the final day of the season, final home game of the season. Yes. And, yes. Um, you, you know, so that, that's a, a little bit of an exclusive to read all over the land. But what a man. Yeah, you you know, I I mean, at the end of the night, as you know, Graham, we stood there talking to him. You were there. I was there. Married Steve from partner, Fanzine. Steve Hale of... from yeah. the Fanzine, who's worked a lot, very hard for us. And, you know, he's now part of the team, part of the show, if you would wish to call it that. And um, 
they, they said how wonderful it was and at the end of the night we stood there and john had, um john and uh, ian were both um socializing with us signing autographs for other people and some of the memorabilia people had brought with them and yeah you you know I, I can't remember now i think we got back to the hotel which is only a 10 minute walk away about half past 12 maybe later <laughs> it's late. uh, you, it you was. know it, it was it was tremendous and you you know it was like you're in the company of your mate you, yeah uh, you, it's you, so you know, nice uh, yeah fantastic really yeah. was. Uh, so we had we had the evening downstairs after our chat. We did a, an auction as well. Do we have to thank who? Do, who did we get the shirt from? That the we got the signed? shirt from the JC Twenty Three Foundation. Through they were great. Mike, yeah, Mike Lepick, who always comes up with the goods, and yeah. also we um, the fanzine purchased a copy of the uh, Liverpool Program publication, which is uh, you, you know if you dropped it on your foot, you'd be in pain. Yeah, it's big, it weighs, big, I think big it's volume, seven yeah. kilo, yeah. nine hundred pages. <laughs> So somebody managed, got hold of a copy of that and they got it signed by or by, by both Ian Callahan and John Keith. So, yeah. yeah. And of course, there were some old programmes that we we um, had floating around from uh, well, from my collection that I didn't need because I've got extras. And um, again, one was the cup final programme from 65. And, uh, and the song sheet. And the song sheet, yeah. yeah. It's got to be the song sheet. And, uh, of course, he signed them as well. So, you know, that added to the value. Did it ever, yeah. So yeah. the bit we did upstairs beforehand was videoed by Ollie Cowan, who did a terrific job, and he's edited it all together and, and put it together. So without uh, further ado, let's have a look at that. This is uh, before our downstairs night at the, at the hideout. The new in, hideout. The new hideout in Southport. And uh, this is us with some very special guests. To Red All Over the Land on YouTube again, you'll see some very familiar faces in front of you here. We're going to start with our honoured guest, who is Ian Callaghan. And what can we say? A true Liverpool legend, 857 games in a career, which will never be beaten, let's face it. Five league titles, two FA Cups, two European Cups, and two UEFA Cups. Callie, welcome to Red All Over the Thank YouTube. Thank you very Red much. YouTube. Thank and you. an MBE as well. MBE <laughs> as and well, yeah. yeah. John Keith, broadcaster, journalist, best-selling author, a man who won the trust of the backroom staff uh, at Liverpool during the Shankly era and beyond. He's been writing and talking about football for 60 seasons. How many books have you written about this fella? Three, Three. about Three. Ian. 33 books altogether, three of them with Ian which was a great privilege, because he's the my longest friend in football, Ian. Was that your first book, John? That was my first book, oh, was wow. the Ian Callaghan story. Wow. Uh, yes, we did that, and uh, when Bill, Sh Bill Shankly launched it with Ian and I, and he said, um, why are you writing a book about Ian now? He's not even finished yet. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true, because another five years later, Ian was still playing football, but um, yeah, what a man, what a great player, and what a wonderful role model for young people following the game. You know, he, he really was. I think his, his on only... On and off the field. On, on and off the field. His only booking was uh, Pat Partridge oh, I remember. at Old Trafford in that League Cup final uh, replay, wasn't Nottingham it? Nottingham Forest. Yeah, and um, even Peter With pleaded with the referee not to book you. Mm, he and, did. And, and he booked you. But that, that was just to make a name for himself. And you'd been well, playing for, <clears throat> for over 500 <throat> games then, and the referee asked you an interesting I think, question, didn't I think he? it was 530-something. <laughs> yeah. And how it happened was um, Phil Thompson tackled John O'Hare Way outside the box. Yes, it was outside the box. I was at the John match. In fact, fell it was in the, the centre of Manchester. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. John O'Hare fell in the box and he gave a penalty, which he scored. And the game got a bit sort of rough. Uh, anyway, a ball bounced between myself and Peter With. And he I was thought, a scouser too. I, he was a scouser, yeah. Nice last, six yeah. foot something, Peter. And I caught him in the ribs. Um, he went down. Pat Partridge came over, sort of in them days, they wrote your name in the book. So he said, what's your name? So I said, Ian Callaghan. <laughs> so he's writing Ian Callaghan in the book. In the meantime, Peter Witt gets up. I said, listen, we both went for the ball. The two of us went for the ball. You know, don't be taking his name. Anyway, he took me name. The following week, um, 
Liverpool tried to get it rescinded, I think that's the word. Yeah. Lovely word, um, yes. And they never did. So some years later, I finished playing and I didn't play golf when I played football. I took up golf and I used to play occasionally in these like you know, celeb things. And Pat Partridge used to play in them. Right. And because he was from the northeast, I think. Mm. And nice. I thought, I'll get to meet this guy one of these days. Anyway, I didn't. And I think it was about six, seven years ago, I read in the newspaper that Pat Partridge had passed away. So right. I never got to meet never him. Never got to meet him no. and, and sort it all out. Because <laughs> you would have had one or two things to say. Well, you know, <laughs> had you met him, you'd probably taken his name, wouldn't you? Yeah. And we, sh we should, of course, as we're introducing the panel, we got sidetracked there slightly. The one and only John Pierman. What can we say about John Pierman, the editor of the longest running and the only surviving Liverpool fanzine read all over the land? I've been buying it since I've been going to the match since I came back uh, from Australia. People buy it on match days. They subscribe all over the world, John, don't yes, they? Yes, true. Over 26 years. And through the, through the uh, fanzine, John has raised thousands of pounds for charity as well, including some memorable penalty shootouts at halftime at Anfield. So... John, well then what's it like to meet this fellow finally? Fantastic. I've spoken to him outside the ground and the thing about Ian is he played with some of the guys who I used to watch in the, uh, in the 60s, early 60s and um, I've got a few questions to ask about those, that, some of those lads because uh, there were one or two who never made the uh, headlines like Roger Hunt, Ian St John, etc. But uh, they were part of the the team that climbed through, well, basically the whole ladder. Ian was there at the very, very start of the, with the promotion in um, 1962. And from then on, it is amazing. And I think you must, it must be the only player uh, that's played in a championship winning side, the title winning side, the FA Cup winning side, Europe, the European Cups, the UEFA Cups, or whatever they were called at the time, and of course the FA Cup, and then the European Cup. You, you know, to play in all of those trophies. Uh, when you made your debut as an eighteen-year-old, I don't think you possibly thought it would go that far, did you? Oh, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think you know. I remember I was taking over from. I remember Bill Shankly he was saying he was going to give me my debut and um, outside right where I was playing, and I was going to take over from the great man Billy Little. And I thought, oh, God, yeah, it wasn't that. Oh, so, um, anyway, I remember the day of my debut. Um, I had to be at Anfield for two o'clock. So I lived in Toxteth in Liverpool, so nobody had cars. Get to the bus stop, and the queue, oh, it was, oh, it was long. So the guys recognised me and sort of said, you better let Ian Callaghan get to the front of the queue. He's making his debut. <laughs> so I, they let me get to the front of the queue. I got the 27 bus up to Anfield, got there just before 2 o'clock, uh, and made me debut. I think we won. Was it 3-1? 4. 4. Four. Yeah. Four. yeah. And um, ne next week, Mohamed Salah on the 82C. The thing about going on the bus, I, I once, not name dropping here, but I did once actually speak to Tom Finney. Oh, and um, oh, wow. he was telling me a story about when uh, him and uh, another player from the North West were, were picked for England. So they, they caught the train, they had to go by train. And... Um, Whoever it was he travelled down with actually bought a cup of tea on the train and he filled in an expenses form and he put the tea down and he was told by the FA, he, under no circumstances could he have that sixpence or whatever it was. So did you claim your bus fare? <laughs> I paid the bus fare. No, I didn't claim it. I must admit, I paid it both ways. <laughs> now you mentioned joining the club, you were very young, you were, what, you were 15 when you were first on the books at Liverpool, is that right? Um... <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, I, I first went to watch Liverpool. I, I was playing for like um, I was playing for the school in the mornings and a boys' club in the afternoon, and so I never got to watch, you know, um, Liverpool at Everton. But anyway, I was thirteen. I went with the lads, my mates, uh, to watch Liverpool play, and uh, you know, they're in the second division. But when this gentleman, and I call him a gentleman. 
Billy Little got the ball. The enthusiasm from the crowd was just unbelievable. I mean, Billy was a fantastic player. Okay. Um, so I think from that day, I went to see Everton some weeks later. Who were in the first division? Who were in the first and division. And your dad was an Everton. And my dad's an Evertonian. Yeah. So, uh, and it wasn't the same. I thought, oh. So I had trials for Liverpool boys. I uh, got through the trials. So I played for Liverpool boys. Obviously, you play for Liverpool boys, scouts watch you. So I got the opportunity to sign for Liverpool at Everton. So my dad said, uh, well, obviously, you're going to Everton, the first division club. I said, no, I, I, I want to go to Liverpool. So he said, but the second division club, he said, they're not going anywhere. So I said, well, I want to sign for Liverpool. So thank God I got my own way because obviously <clears throat> that was 50, 1958, uh, 59, Bill Shankly arrived, and 60 gave me a debut. Well, made me, signed me professional and then gave me a debut. And the interesting thing was, Ian, that... Um if your dad was, wasn't was convinced about you joining Liverpool, uh, you got a visit to your flat from Bill Shankly. In Toxton. Which yeah. caused a furore, didn't it? And so I, I said to Mr Shankly, I said, well, I said, you know, I said, at this particular moment, I'm working in town, and I'm going to start saving me time soon as a sense leak engineer. So I said, I've got a good job. So I said, so you'll have to come down, really, and see me mum and dad. So anyway, he turned up in his big car, I lived in tenements, and uh, well, we had this charisma about him, John, oh, didn't he? Oh. So as soon as he walked in, and you know, he chatted to me, mum and dad, and said they think you know Ian can make professional footballer. So uh, they they were convinced. So I signed, yeah, and that was it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and my dad, my dad. So soon turned his cold from heaven. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that was Shanks, wasn't it? That was Shanks. Yeah. But I remember you telling me that he always looked after you. You never had to ask for a oh, rise. God, no. Because he yeah. told your mum and dad he'd always look after mm. you, which I think is wonderful. He did, yeah. I never had a crossword with him in 14 seasons. There, yeah, there was a lovely story about Shanks following on from the uh, commitment he gave to your mum and dad. You were in Liège... For a European game, and he said, "You all have to be in by midnight." Yeah, yeah. And uh, will you tell the story? I think it's well. We were staying one. in this square, <laughs> and we were staying in the hotel, and there was like a like a, a casino at the other end of the, the square. And uh, he sort of said, "He said um, you can go out." He said, "And have a beer." He says, "But you're back here for um, midnight." So anyway, the and the game's the next day. No, no, oh, no, 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 no. We, played. we played. Oh, you already played, okay. We already right. played. Yeah, yeah. And um, we had a good result. But I think we were playing Chelsea uh, that, that week, yeah. Anyway, um, so the time went so quickly. So um, there's a few of us sort of never, um, a lot of the lads went back, and we never thought, you know, never looked at the time. Anyway, um, I forget it, there's a, a couple of us. I think it was you, you said it was you, uh, Jerry, Jerry Byrne, Byrne and Ian St. John. We were roommates, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we get back to the hotel. Before we got in the hotel, the lads are on the balcony saying, Bill Shankly's inside waiting for you. So, <laughs> so, so we go in, and I think, I, I don't know, Jerry Byrne went in first, and uh, I could hear Bill Shankly saying, Jerry Byrne, he said, I'll be seeing you in the morning. Don't so, and I think Ian St. John went in and he said to him, Oh, if anybody's going to stay out, it'll be you. So I run in and he had to go past reception up the stairs. And I could hear him say to me, Ian Callaghan, when we get home, we're going to tell your mother. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lovely story, that. <laughs> and some great moments with that team. First of all, the promotion, that must have been a big deal. And then. Uh, league titles, 64, 66, 73, 76, 77. But I think the big one for fans of that era was the FA Cup in 65, wasn't it? Did, did the players feel that way too? I think so. I, you know, I mean, they did never won the FA Cup in the history. Uh, and, you know, just get to the final, you know, the, the, you know, the, the thing with tickets. And I remember coming home after training, my mum would say, you know, I'm in the butchers here, and any chance of getting the two tickets with the butcher? <laughs> And then my dad, who worked on the docks, he came home and said, 
the mates asking, you know, any chance of a couple of tickets. So by the time Thursday came around, you know, we were going to London. Um, we were just glad to get out the... Uh, get uh, get away tickets. from Liverpool. <laughs> and we, we got to London. I, I always remember because Bill Shankly had organised to go uh, to the London Palladium. So on what night was this? It was a Thursday night. Right. Uh, so we went to the London Palladium, and Doddy was on. Uh, worst possible person to be on if you want to get on. Oh, Doddy. <laughs> so anyway, I, I, Bill Shanky had organised the coach for about half past ten. Because I mean, as you mentioned, you don't get out with Doddy. <laughs> so uh, you know, and, but Doddy was a he was a red, wasn't he? Oh, avid, really avid, avid red. Avid red. Yeah, so yeah. So yeah. that relaxed us, I think, on the Thursday. We trained Friday, and then, you know, the, the thing Saturday when you, you know, you play at Wembley. That was my first time at Wembley, um, you know, and going through Wembley Way and the motorbike police took it. In. You know, it was just absolutely fantastic. Yeah, yeah. and the whole country's watching because oh. it was the only live game we got, wasn't it? So it was just really, absolutely. really special. It was, it was the centre of the universe, the FA Cup final oh. on Saturday, wasn't it? It was just brilliant. Um, talking to Shanks many years later, he, he he actually picked that out as the the greatest memory he had because of what winning the FA Cup at last meant. It was yeah. seventy years of waiting, yeah. and he says people have died, and we still have they still haven't seen Liverpool win the cup. And we went there; it was a it was a scandal they hadn't won it. He, these wonderful emotive phrases Shanks came out with, but he he said that was that was his greatest memory of. Picking the cup up, that. And you were instrumental in the victory because it was your cross to St. John, wasn't it? That tight cross, what we now call an assist. Well, we don't yeah, call that yeah, then. But it, but, it, but it was yours. The, the, in extra that time as well. That's the first FA Cup final to have extra time, I think, wasn't it? Yeah. I think, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, and sure. then my best mate, my roommate, Jerry Byrne, broke his collarbone in the first eight minutes. Yeah. Played on. Played on right through the game. And uh, he crossed the ball for the first no goal for Roger. Yeah, yeah, and so what an act of bravery. absolutely yeah. unbelievable. In fact, after, after the game, I remember Bill Shankly saying that Jerry Byrne deserves all the medals. Yeah, yeah he did. Yeah. Mm. And that was another example of another the other genius, Bob Paisley, because he knew right away that um, Jerry had fractured his collarbone, and um, they kept the amazing thing was you kept it from Leeds. They didn't have a clue. No, no, wow. They didn't have a clue. But at the end of the game, the Wembley doctor came to Bob and said, um, what's up with Jerry Byrne? He said, he's got, he's got a fractured collarbone. So he said, no, he hasn't. He's not fractured his collarbone. Are you bloody telling me that it's bloody fractured? Anyway, they took him off to hospital, fractured collarbone. Bob always got it right. There was another example at Tranmere Rovers when he was watching Joey Jones and playing for Wrexham. Joey was carried off and Bob said to us before he left Prenton Park, if you find out what's wrong, would you give me a ring? So I'm ringing Bob at 10 past midnight to say, um, they st the Tranmere doctor, Bob, says he's got a pot fracture. I can't say it, what he said. B, O W L O C K S. he's got bloody ligaments. Anyway, X-ray ligaments. He, um, he, he could actually diagnose injuries watching players on television. And he'd tell us, David Nish um, got a bad injury and we were in the office on Monday in Bob's office. He said, the Nish fella, I think he's got a cartilage. And he did, you know. It was quite, he was uncanny, wasn't he? Absolutely yeah. amazing. And of course, Bill needed that because he didn't like going near injured players. Yeah, he, like he, he kept out of the treatment room and everything. Yeah. I mean, Chris Lawler tells a story. He played 360 something games on the spin and uh, Bob, he's on, I'm on the training ground, he said, and I find one side there's Bob and the other side there's Bill. And um, Shank says to Bob, what's wrong with the malingerer? <laughs> <laughs> and Chris said, that's when I realised you can't get injured with Shanks, you know. <laughs> so that was 65, 66, you're in the World Cup squad. Played against France. Yes, yeah. And in the final itself, you didn't play... But you did have a, a very important duty on the day, thanks <laughs> oh, to Nobby yeah. Styles. Yeah, yeah. It was. Um, I mean, it was a <clears throat> great part of my career to be in the twenty-two. That you know, to be in the that won the World Cup. Um, you know, they're a fantastic bunch of, of guys, and um, 
Yeah, I remember the you know the final, um, and there's no subs then, so the eleven who weren't playing were ready to go take the seats. And uh, Nobby said to me, he said, Carl, he said, would you do me a favour if we if we win the World Cup? So I said, well, yeah, what do you want me to do? So he just gave me a big bunch of tissues, put them in my pocket, went to the you know stand. I thought, what's he doing here? So bring it out. And it was his front teeth. <laughs> so I thought, oh my God. And there's a fantastic sort of footage of after the game where Nobby's got the World Cup on his head. He's got a socks around his ankles, running with Bobby Moore. And biggest smile, no teeth. Yeah. And I didn't get them back to him till after all the rigmarole at Wembley. Back in the dressing room. Could you not get to him, or had you just forgotten? I, I, I just forgot all about the, 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 the thing that was going on. Won the, won the World Cup. Yeah, yeah. They didn't won the World Cup. And they've got <laughs> people were on the pitch. You know, and I don't mean spectators, but you know, a lot of people were on the pitch, and so you know, just forgot all about it. So they got back to the dressing room. Yeah. But although Ian wasn't in the team, he got a World Cup winners' medal, and he's one of only three players who won the European Cup, the league title, and the World Cup. And he's, the others are Bobby Charlton and Nobby Styles. Yeah. 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 You had to wait a while for that medal, though, didn't you? No, it wasn't bad. 42 years. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, that, uh, that World Cup winning side, um, of course, it was picked by Alf Ramsey, who did things slightly different. He wasn't, um, you couldn't influence, the press couldn't influence him because there was all the thing about Jimmy Greaves. And Jimmy Greaves never played for England again, did he, after the World Cup? And. Um, I'd like to, um, I know how upset he was, uh, and also the London press. Um, but uh, I just wonder, because I thought, I think Jimmy Greaves to me was the greatest goal, goal scorer I ever, I, ever, I ever watched. I mean, he, you, you know, he, he tapped them in from two yards. He never scored many from outside the box. Oh, no, and no, the no. only player I ever saw come close to him was Robbie Fowler. But I don't know. Also from top school. Yeah. How, how yeah, was yeah, Jimmy? Yeah. Gre how was Jimmy Greaves at that um, final? Because I say that basically ended his career. Well, obviously, and he was so disappointed. I don't think, you know, I mean, I, I think even after, you know, well after the World Cup, you know, we used to have reunions. Um, the lads used to turn up a couple of days away, playing golf, take the wives, and uh, but Jimmy never come. No. No, and uh, to tell you, the only time I saw him uh, after the World Cup was some, obviously, some years later, forty-two years later, when we got our World Cup medal. Oh, right, yeah. You know, when we went to Ten Downing Street. Mm. Can't trust the Royal Mail. Can mm. you? <laughs> <laughs> so, nineteen seventy-three, first European thing. It was UEFA Cup. Then uh, seventy-four, another FA Cup. And, John, you've got a story about the Charity Shield that year, haven't you, 74? Yes, when the infamous um, <clears throat> Keegan Bremner. Um, yeah, you know, I think there's a little coming together. They the, the got a bit, uh, yeah. And, of course, there was a sending off of both players. And I think they got banned for about, well, uh, what today would seem a lifetime. I think they missed something like 11 games they each did, and, yeah, and got yes. fined. Five hundred pound or something. And amazingly, during the spell he was out for Liverpool, Phil Borsma started scoring all those goals, didn't? He? Uh, Strange. <laughs> yeah, and then uh, with Phil Borsma, of course, he became known slightly different under Sue Ness's era, didn't he? Yes. But um, but yeah, that uh, of course the penalty shootout. I, I, I might be wrong here, but it was, must have been the first penalty shootout at Wembley, um, because they were very very new. Uh, in fact, the you know they didn't come into into the FA Cups and competition domestic competitions for possibly another fifteen years or so. But um, you got you scored the decisive penalty, didn't you? Mm. And the Leeds goalkeeper David Harvey missed. Right, I think. Yes. It was, yeah, I think I was the, in the penalty takers initially because didn't he score? Was it five all six, or five, six yeah, five something yeah. like that? Yeah. And then, uh, as I say, I wasn't in the, 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 the five. And then uh, I was called upon, yeah. So it was a bit of a, uh, oof, I, I remember sort of 
putting the ball down and not. Oh, God, it was. Uh, Did the goal seem further away racking. than normal uh, oh. under that pressure? Well, they'd only taken two penalties before that. And um, I played in a game at Wembley where, that, that, sorry, at Anfield. <laughs> and I think it was against the Arsenal, Jimmy Fennell. Yes, it was, yeah. It was. And um, I think all four forwards had scored. I was the only one that didn't score or hadn't scored. So get a penalty, and if he said, "But Cali take it, yeah, he's the only one, only forward hasn't scored, yeah." So, and that even taking the penalty, and Jimmy Fennell dived and waited for the ball to arrive. <laughs> so, <laughs> honest to God, it was a yes, it's penalty. in your book that yeah, dreadful <laughs> penalty. So I never took another one. But if you're right, John, that's another little bit of trivia. If, if you are the, the first winning scorer of a penalty sh of the first penalty shootout at Wembley, there's another little bit of little, little badge on it. Wembley. I mean, there were penalty shoot the penalty shootouts in Europe before that because Everton had one uh, in at Goodison in the first cup, I think oh, it was. Yeah. But um, that would have been right, I think, at Wembley. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And was it by this stage you changed positions? Because you started out on the right, on the wing, and then you had the cartilage. <coughs> yeah, uh, that was 1970. Oh, well, that was 19... So, yeah, so you were now well into the centre of midfield by now. Uh, yeah. yeah, that was... Uh, I mean, I remember getting the cartilage operation, and in them days, you know, you were out for... I think I was out for about six weeks. Didn't you have it in Manchester? I had it in Manchester. Mm. Mm. And I don't think the club came to see you, did they? Don't, well, no, nobody, nobody, <laughs> nobody went to see you. <laughs> so, uh, and the only reason I went to Manchester is because they fought it out with the, with the, 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 the guy at Liverpool um, and Tommy Booth, who played centre-half for City. Mm. Uh, he he just had a cartilage. So I think the club, Bill Shankly, had rang... I think Joe Mercer was in charge then, and sort of said about, you know, Tommy Booth and Ian Callaghan needs a cartilage. So I ended up going to Manchester. So I was in Austin for about 10 days. Um, but did you so think... Did I come you, back. Yeah, it was, it was a new uh, career. Got back, and the team were playing very well. Brian Hall was playing out, out on the right. Um, and then they had, a, they had a, a lad, a local lad, who played many games, uh, John McLaughlin, mm. who was playing... Central midfield, and John got injured, and uh, Bill Shankly decided to put me in central <coughs> midfield, and I had another career. Yeah. But the amazing story wasn't it, Ian, that they signed Kevin Keegan to replace Ian, and it was only through our first team against the reserves, <coughs> which the reserves usually won, but this time uh, they played Kevin up alongside John Toshak. Yeah. And Shankly says, right, we're going to keep that against Nottingham Forest. So Keegan and Toshak started against Forest up front. Right. And that was it. So all this talk about replacing Ian went out the window anyway. And Ian then played on till 1978, yeah. you know, yeah. Yeah. which was amazing. Uh, in fact, 77 was the, the first, was the European Cup final, the first. Was it, because for me it was a big deal. You know, I was... I was in, in my teens, but the the European Cup, I think, you know, was was fans of say John's generation. It was the sixty five FA Cup. For me, it was it was the seventy seven mm -hmm. European Cup. Did it feel that way for you? I, I think it did. You know, I, when you when I look back at my career, I, you know, I, I always pick out sixty five and seventy seven. Yeah, they're the two. Because models. it was the first time they'd won the FA Cup, the first time they won the European Cup. Yeah, and you know, okay, I was. Lucky enough to be in the teams, but um, the seventy-seven. Uh, you know, I, I think um, it was in Rome, and I, I always remember because I, I was a sub on the Saturday against Manchester United in the FA Cup. Yeah, and I got on for the last twenty minutes. So you wouldn't have thought you're playing on well, the Wednesday night. So it wasn't until I got in Monday morning um, to train and then to get ready to travel. To Rome, um, and that we were just starting off training, just jogging, and Bob Paisley jogged beside me. So I always tell the story. I must have been jogging slow for Bob to keep up. <laughs> <laughs> he, had, he, had this, he had this sticky knee. He needed the cartilage, but he'd never get it out. Trying to keep up. Yeah. So, and he said to me, he said, um, "Do you want to play in Rome?" So I looked at him. I thought, "This is the European Cup final." 
So, of course I want to play. He said, well, you're playing. And ran away. So <laughs> I, I knew Monday morning before anybody else that I was going to play in Rome. Wow. So yes. it was just... It's a great story. It was just unbelievable, really. What, what, what was the difference between Bob and Shankly's approach to, to say, man management back then? Well, I, I, I mean, as it was, you know, I mean, I always say Bill Shankly, you know, he's the foundation of the football club now, without a single doubt, in a worldwide football club. And he's the foundation, <clears throat> without a doubt. But, you know, I mean, Bob didn't even want the job. John no. did he? When uh, Peter Bill Robinson Shankly resigned. Uh, he was then... Uh, chief exec and John Smith, the chairman, went down in Peter's words on bended knee three or four times to Bob to take the job. And eventually he said, Well, I'll take it till you get a proper manager. <laughs> so 19 trophies and nine seasons later, you know, it was just incredible. It was unbelievable. Uh, Emlyn himself, I remember him, he was telling me, and would probably have heard it too, his first team talk, he said, I'm only here till you get another manager in. But, you know, Amazing man. But it was his breadth of knowledge, wasn't it, Ian? Oh, yeah, yeah, his yeah, breadth of knowledge was incredible. Yeah, but he, he did have, you know, difficulty chatting to that the press. The and well, what have you. But Bill Shankly was the, the other way. That was, yeah, his big, that was his big problem, because he was 55 thrown into this, and he had no experience of dealing with the press. So he got half a dozen of us, five of us, I think, and he said, if I sort of talk to you, can you sort of make it presentable? So we had that arrangement all the way through his management. And we called Bob the great train robber because he never finished sentences. <laughs> but, and, he, you know, and he used to say, we're going to say this, Bob, is that right? And he said, I, I put that out like, you know. And, uh, but in return, Bob, Bob told us in advance he was going to quit and he was going to announce it at the football writers' dinner in Durham. So it gave us time to, five of us, um, to get the story written and sent hours and hours before Bob stood up about 10 o'clock at night in Durham to announce, because there was panic amongst the others, because they had no idea. But uh, So he, he looked after us in return. It was a lovely relationship, actually. But what a lovely guy. Yeah. And the Football Writers Player of the Year, you won that as well. What year was that? 74. Right, so the FA yeah. Cup year. I think I'm not too sure that I was the first Liverpool player to... Winning this sports writer, because Mo Salah's just yeah, won it now, yeah, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. yeah, so... Yeah. Uh, so did you have to go and make a speech? Well, then we, we were playing Newcastle in the final right. in 74, yeah. so it was a Thursday night, and um, so I wasn't going to dinner. I was just going in after the dinner had finished to... Um, Bill Shankly came with me to wherever it was in London, and... Um, I think it was the Grove and the House. I'm not too sure, John. From Park Lane. I mm -hmm. thought, oh, I you know, so. I mean, I was, I'd had a little speech wrote out and what have you, and I remember, you know, sort of the doors opening and the top table with all these players who'd won, the football writers, you know, I, I, I panicked. I thought, I've, I've got to go in there and stand up and make a speech. Oh, my God. So he, Bill Shandy must have looked at my face and sort of said, he said, now go in there and enjoy it. He said, you get out of this game what you put into it. Enjoy it. So you think he knew so, that, you, that you, you, were, you, know, you were losing your bottle? And you think oh, he could sense he must it? have realised. But yeah. when, when he opened the, the, the doors for me to go in, with, with him, you know, it was just, yeah, so I look, you... looked at the top table, the players who had won it. Oh. So, and was that one of Shankly's things that he could see if, if tension was getting to a play, well, he could I, calm I, I, them down? Yeah, I, 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 no, you know, but at that, that particular occasion... You need a coach of a different yeah, kind. Knew yeah. I, had, I, I had to get up and I was probably, you know, I mean, wasn't an outgoing sort of lad, you know, so I was a bit of a shy lad, really. So, you know, to get up amongst that, you know, array of people. Ah, so, anyway, I did it. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. On the theme you mentioned there, Graham taking the tension away, uh, Bill invited Jimmy Tarbuck into the dressing room to tell jokes and brighten things up and release tension, didn't he? Mm, okay. And Jimmy was very proud of that because he wanted to be a Liverpool player, essentially. <laughs> <isn't he? laughs> Jimmy Tarbuck and Frankie Vaughan came in yes. in 65. Yeah, in, at yeah. Wembley, yeah. We should talk about your England career as well because there's a bit of a gap in it, isn't there? 
was a, it wasn't, wasn't that long. It was only 11 and a half years. <laughs> oh, that's incredible. So, so, so you, you, was your first call up the World Cup, the, the, the game against France in 66? It was, yeah. And then the second game? Um, <clears throat> I remember, 77, uh, I think it was. It was 77. Um, in Luxembourg. When they had it, all it went. It was. It, yeah, it, 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 it went, yeah. It was, um, the manager was... Um, Ron, Ron Greenwood, Ron, 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 yeah, Ron Greenwood. Yeah. I and remember we, the Liverpool team. we were playing. We were playing at um, we up in the northeast, Middlesbrough, Middlesbrough, yeah. and Ronnie Moran sort of said, he said, um, after we've had our meeting about the game, Middlesbrough playing Middlesbrough, he said Ron Greenwood wants to come in and just sort of um, talk about how he admires Liverpool. You know, when he's going to pick <clears throat> Liverpool players. So I said to him, and I always remember, I said, well, he won't need me because I think I was about 35. <laughs> so I said, well, it won't mean. He said, you're in the meeting. Yeah. So anyway, went in the meeting and Ron Green would give this, you know, about how he admired Liverpool, the way he played, blah, blah, blah. And then some weeks later, I got a letter to say I was picked in a squad. Um, and I thought, well, I think they've sent this letter to the wrong player. I think it should be Jimmy Case. So, so anyway, but and I ended up playing um, a game at Wembley, and then Luxembourg, wasn't it? Away, yeah. So two two games. Mm. There aren't there can't be any other players who've played for their national team with an eleven year break in them. I think the longest. It's, it's got to be. Mm. Yeah, you're a man of mm. records. You really are. You're, you're a pub trivia dreamer. <laughs> So talking of records, what was it like to be on Merseyside when that pop group did start? Well, I I I think the mid sixties was the most great sort of time for me. Being a local lad, and you know the, the team were on the up, um, and then you got the music started, Beatles, Jerry and the Pacemakers. So it was just fantastic to be. You know, playing for Liverpool, being a local lad, and all these things that happened in Liverpool, and oh. the, and the comedy as well. You see, Doddy yeah. Tarbuck, yeah, and, and you have to say also in the sixties, Everton were winning things as well. So there was a great vibrancy about the whole city, yeah. in every kind of field, wasn't there? Was. Sport, yeah. entertainment, yeah. it was so quite it was remarkable. Fantastic. I, I, you know, I, I often say, well, I was fortunate to play sixties and seventies. But the 60s, I well, had to pick a time, I think it was the 60s. Yeah. Yeah. And the cop was known for its comedy and its music as well. Do you have a favourite chant or song from the cop in a match? Oh, they, they, they used to sing, it's Cali, it's Cali, it's, it's Cali. Cali. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, yeah, so, you know, I mean, it, 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 was just, it was just an amazing time, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Everything was happening. The but wasn't the one when the keeper spilled it and the and the cop responded? That was uh, oh, that was um, yeah. Leeds. Yeah. Leeds. Leeds, yeah, at Anfield. Gary, yeah. Was it Gary's? Gary Sprague, yeah. But well, it was it was actually what happened was after he'd spilled it, um, the announcer played Careless Hands and the cop joined in. Right. It was um, it was the predecessor to uh, what do you call it? The current announcer. Um, yeah, George, George's yeah. predecessor. Um, oh, what was his name? Anyway, he played it, and the, the cop took it up. You know, just to rub it in. Yeah. <laughs> was it was a remarkable the, goal. Though, there, there was a player that played in the '64 team, and I always believe is um, one of those players that no one. If anybody's talking about the great Liverpool sides, they never mention him. And I always think he was possibly the guy that. Um, Shot Liverpool to the title in '64. That was Alf Harrismith. Alfie, yeah. And Al, Alf yeah. was possibly my favourite player, not because of his footballing ability, because he was called Alf. <laughs> and he, and at that time, if there was any cartoon yes. characters yes. in comics, they were called Alf. And could he yes. score goals? And could he board, board to score? Was the comment? He could score every part of his body. Oh. Oh. He, was, he was incredible, Alfie. Yeah. That wasn't there a story, Ian? Um, Alf came from an area just uh, 
north of Manchester. Oh, it was like a little village. A little village. Yeah. And yeah. as the Liverpool team bus was going past, yeah. wasn't his mother out oh, to the team house. bus? Yeah, it was yeah. called I think was it we were on our whistle. Tint whistle. Tint whistle. Tint whistle. Well That's done, right. John. Tint whistle. We were on our way, I think we were on your way. Past Tint Russell to Sheffield. Yeah, that's right. We were yeah. playing in probably one of the Sheffield clubs. And as the bus went through the village, <laughs> they're all out. <laughs> <laughs> well, Roger, Roger, Hunt, Roger Hunt told me once that uh, he said, uh, he said the, well, on one day, it was a bit similar to that where the coach actually stopped and picked Alf up on the way to a game. I remember he did. And he said, yeah, and he got in, and as they were going past something like the Working Men's Club or something, Alf turned round to Roger Hunt and said, I was in there last night. <laughs> and of course, Shankly and company walked in behind them and Roger told him to keep his voice down. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, just... Fantastic story. He, he was, and the, the other player who I can remember joining Liverpool because it, um, it shook my mother. She was a Liverpool fan, not an Everton fan. It was when Dave Hickson signed. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And um, the cannonball kid. Cannonball kid. And because yeah. you'd have played in the same team as him for a few games. I did. Yeah. I did. And he was a bit of a character, wasn't no, he? No, great character, Dave. Yeah. 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 And I, yeah. You know, I mean, I used to get invited to Everton and he was always there with his blazer nice on, guy, Dave. doing the hospitality. Yeah. Uh, Great character, absolutely mm -hmm. fantastic character. Yeah, bit of a reputation, though. <laughs> On the field, yeah. yeah and yeah. you know, years later, he told me because we interviewed Dave because we we've been we've just completed a documentary about Dixie Dean, film documentary. So we went to Dave because he knew him. And he said, you know, I regret the way I behaved on the football field. I was sent off far too often, and I should have I should have grown up and reacted better when people challenged me. And I thought it was very honest of him, that. And, of course, when Shanks came to Liverpool, he inherited Dave after selling him from Huddersfield. And he didn't like him. He didn't. He liked him, but he didn't want him in his team. And Shanks admitted that on one trip, he said to Dave Hickson, we'll pick you up somewhere near the Mersey Tunnel and told the driver to drive straight on and le <laughs> left poor old Dave. <laughs> That's true, that. That's true. Another time, Dave caused a furore because he, he went out after training at Anfield and he said, my car's gone, my car's gone. So the club rang the police and they said, well, uh, he said, well, it's a black thing. He said, oh, hang on. Sorry, I came on the bus. <laughs> <laughs> That's gospel true. Dave told me that as well. <laughs> so, Ian, you played in the great sides of the 60s and the 70s. How does the modern Liverpool team compare to the sides you played in? Well, I, I, I think, you know, what Jürgen Klopp's achieved has just been absolutely fantastic. I really do. You know, I mean, it, it reminds me of Bill Shankly, you know, he's got this charisma about him. Um, when you meet him, I've been fortunate to meet him a couple of times, and he's the same. He really is, and, uh, you know, I mean, what a squad of players he's put together. Mm -hmm. Without a doubt, it's just absolutely fantastic. Mm. Mm. So what's next for you? You're 80 now. <laughs> You're still involved in the club because we see you there every now and again. Oh, you still yes. do the Legends Tours and, and uh, all that kind of stuff? Yeah, I do the Q&As for the Legends Tours, um, match days um, in the lounges. Yeah, so uh, yeah, very much involved. And uh, I mean, the club has been absolutely great with former players. They really have. Um, and I enjoy going, uh, seeing, you know, the former players as well, you know, meeting up on a match day and uh, having a chat, something to eat. Um, yeah, so it's, it's absolutely great. Yeah. Well, it's been an honour to meet you. Oh, so God, thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. Just very quickly, there's a, just uh, from what Ian was saying there, a little exclusive for the podcast. Had Liverpool won the title on that Saturday, a week, not long ago, before we recorded this, um, the man who would have brought out the replica trophy to present to Jordan Henderson was Ian Callaghan. They'd arranged that. Wow. Ian and the chaplain, Bill Bygrove. Yeah, they right. so, so have to wait till next season I've had then. a rehearsal on the Saturday night. <laughs> <laughs> just, in case. just in case. Just in case. The chaplain got his prayers wrong. The chaplain. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The chaplain. He said he had a surplus of them. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> well, thanks again, Ian. It's oh, been it's terrific good. just to meet you, but never mind to get some great Thank stories so as well. Thanks to you, John. Thank Reed. you, John. Thank you so much. And John Pearman, thanks for setting this all up. And, and no, well, between John, you and John, John's done that. Doing this. Oh, it's a pleasure. And the Lovely people here at the, at the Hyde... Is the, the new hideout. hideout. The new hideout in hideout. Southport. So if you want <laughs> somewhere to come and hide out, this is the place. <laughs> Ian Kelly, thank you very oh, much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks. Thank you. Absolute pleasure. Thank you. It's something else, isn't it, John? Uh, it's it's going to be a piece That's of history, that. that, I think, you know, <clears throat> when Callie was 80 and what good shape he was in, you know? And as you said earlier, after that, we did the thing downstairs for the punters who'd come along to the new hideout in Southport. And he just kept on going and we were there till way after midnight. <laughs> and Callie yeah, never, yeah. he never even gave any sign of flagging at all. No one well, started getting the drinks in, didn't they? Not, um, you know, <laughs> we were no, trying to not, draw the not, raffle. We wanted to get him to draw the raffle. We couldn't. He was at the bar buying drinks for people. <laughs> <laughs> but he, he was, he was, no, he was, he was brilliant. The whole night was brilliant. And, you, you know, thanks uh, to all the people that made it um, what it was. That includes John Keith, uh, Ollie, Ollie Cowan, and, of course, Jimmy Hill uh, at, at the hideout. Plus yeah. yourself, Graham, coming along, and, and Steve and Mary, who were there. Yeah, yeah, you know, it was brilliant, absolutely great. And it, it, it's given us f food for thought that we may do similar I ideas in the, in the very near future. But yeah. you know, there's going to be a long gap coming up uh, in the new season, which we'll talk about in a moment, when the um, the World Cup starts being played. You, you know, so there's going to be at least, a f I think, a five-week gap between where, where we should have some free dates. Um, so yeah, you know that we can we can look at doing this again, and it, it was it, it was a pleasure meeting both John and Ian. You you know really really was tremendous. Yeah, and to hear John's uh, impressions of particularly his impression of Bob Paisley, uh, something else yeah, as well. Yeah, I mean, lo yeah. Lots of people do Shankly, but not many people do Paisley. <laughs> uh, it's good yeah, to you do. We've had a lot it, of comments. It, 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 sorry, John. Sorry. Sorry, go on. Well, I'm just saying we've had a lot of comments. Um, people have been messaging in uh, during the live broadcast. If you're watching this as the recorded version, uh, you won't be able to do that. But if you're watching live, uh, welcome your comments. And uh, John Williams, has, uh, he says that uh, Callie looks as fit as a robber's dog. And uh, yeah, he did. He, 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 was in, he was in great shape. And Ishkia Page has messaged. Ishkia is watching and listening in the United States of America. And she says she had a friend in grade school that moved from England and was a Liverpool fan. And she mentioned that uh, to get the football scores, because there's no internet back then, their fr his friends would ring up and ask if they would accept a collect call, reverse charges, and would suddenly just shout out the score. And then they'd go, no, I'm not accepting it. So they didn't have to pay for it. And that was how they used to keep up with the scores back when Callie was playing. So uh, lots of memories, because he was in so many great sides, wasn't so he? So many, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hey, well, he, he, uh, he never played in what you'd call a bad side, so it, it, it was all, all forward. And, uh, of course, that's the, that, that's the, 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 the promotion of uh, 62 is the foundation of the modern Liverpool. Uh, you know, yes, Bill Shankly is responsible for so much of that, but so were those players. And yeah. you know they they stayed together for an awful long time. Yeah, uh, you, you know, there were some characters. I mean, Ian St. John was a character, uh, a feisty character. You you know, and Roger Hunt was the, uh, the total opposite. You you know, he he is another perfect gentleman. Yeah, and it is the, the whole the whole thing. Liverpool of today is built on the foundation stones of what those people put together. And you mentioned John Williams there. John has just written a book uh, or um, added to a book, and it's uh, basically bringing things right up to date of all the history of Liverpool from Shankly to Klopp. And, you you know, we, we'll be mentioning that in the next issue of the fanzine. So, yeah, and it, 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 John John's written, a th I don't know how many books, too many, <laughs> to mention um yeah. and he uh is from liverpool but he i met him because he actually lives in leicester right okay well yeah. talking of leicester and the fanzine the new issue will be on sale in time for the charity shield or the community shield as it's now called and it's being played in leicester what do you think of that decision moving it away from wembley 
Well, only the FA can do that, can't they? You, you, you know, find a place that nobody really wants to play it and let's go there. Uh, that's no criticism of Leicester City because um, the final was played at Filbert Street in 72. Sorry, the Shield yeah. uh, was played there in 72 and um, Leicester beat Liverpool 1-0. But, you, you, you know, it's a, it's a charity event. So you want to make money. Yeah. So why go to a ground that holds 32,000 or 33,000 when you could play it at Old Trafford if it's available, which holds 75,000? It needs rebuilding. We know about that. We've reading that in the paper at the moment. But you could play it there. You could have gone to Newcastle, a ground that holds 60,000. You could have played it there. I mean, no, if they wanted no, to keep it in London, they, they could have played it at Tottenham's new ground if they wanted to keep it in London and, and a neutral ground. But I went to the Charity Shield one year in Cardiff. You know, it's another big ground they could have used again. But no, no. That, that, Yeah, and that, um, I think I went to, I'm not sure if it was three at, at Cardiff. Yeah. Uh, what a great stadium. Um, you, you know, one of, uh, we talk about Anfield um, South as Wembley, but Cardiff was Anfield, Wales, and yeah, brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And we used to take so many thousands of supporters there. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know what the th thinking is. I know somebody did say to me, it's because Leicester City are the current holders. Well, that's fine. But um, if I, they beat Manchester City last year, so had Manchester City won it, would they have played it at the Etihad? I doubt it. Yeah. Because there's a women's game apparently on Wembley on that day. I don't know why they couldn't move the day. Or I'd be, you know, I'm not being sexist, but I'd be very surprised if Wembley sells out on that day. I know, it, it may, it may 90, sell out. The, but, but there's the following day, you, you know, the FA Cup final was played at Wembley and there was 83, 84,000 there. And the following day, they had the the women's FA Cup final. So they could have done something. It, it's just, as I say, looking at it, it again, it gets a mention in the fanzine as to yeah. why they're playing it at Leicester. But, um, yeah, not criticising, no criticism of Leicester City or anything like that. Um, but the ground's but, not that big. What is, what's the attendance 30, at Leicester? About 32,000, Compared 000. to 90,000 potential at Wembley. You know, it yeah, just seems and, and odd. as I say, the... the Possibility if they could have played it just Old Trafford if that was available, yeah. and you would have got more. The 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 thing is, let let's not forget it's the Community Shield, so the money is supposedly going to into the community. Yeah. How much they actually get, only the FA knows. Yeah. But yeah, you, know, you know, if they wanted to call it a money making scheme and play it there, fine. You yeah. you know, we, we we'd have gone to Old Trafford, even though it's um, only up the road for the City fans. We'd have gone there in great numbers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, it's not long now until Anfield, the concert venue, becomes Anfield, the football ground again, is it? No, and uh, it's done well out the concerts. So... You went to one of them, didn't you? Yeah, I went to Elton John. I'm not an Elton John fan, um, but I have to say he was amazing. Uh, I think he's older than I am. He, he was absolutely brilliant. The whole show... He sat down because he can't move. It took him a long while to move from one side of the stage to the other when he was um, taking a, a bow. But, uh, yeah, it, it was fantastic. And the thing about it was um, Elton John himself said, what a great place to have a concert, what a, an atmosphere. Uh, and he said it's the best stadium he's played in. Wow. Um, and, you, you know, and he's, he's played all around the world. But, yeah, fantastic. And I... I I will have an abiding memory of um, watching uh, the cop, and I, I, I love watching the cop when it's in full cry. But on this night, it was different. There weren't Liverpool fans in the main, and he was—I think it was Crocodile Rocky was playing, and they were all rocking and rolling on the cop. I was trying <laughs> to move, but um, being tempted by Mary, but uh, I, I don't move that well. Never have done. Yeah, never been a dancer, but uh, yeah, and it, it was just amazing to see. And then when he sang Candle in the Wind, they all had, had a light, uh, no flares. They're all phones or whatever yeah. they were holding up. And it, it looked the whole ground looked tremendous. It made you appreciate just what Anfield is, you you know. And uh, Elton John said some nice words and uh, it, it was brilliant. And Kenny Dogleash was there uh, as well, so... In the, in the dearer seats, but uh, yeah. yeah, 
Yeah, but so, he was in the Kenny Dalgleish stand rather than he was in, in the, the yeah, he was in his own stand. Yeah, yeah. So it was absolutely brilliant. And, and the crowd know, sang "You'll Never Walk Alone," didn't they? The same yeah, as they did yeah, at the Rolling and, Stones um, concert. I don't know if they did at the Eagles, but they did at, uh, yeah, at Elton so, John. But it, it, but it was. I mean, the Stones must have been amazing because again, uh, they're people that are older than I am. Uh, you, you know, so and to see Mick Jagger move around, yeah, I, I wish I'd have been there. Yeah, yeah. I wish I could move off as well as him. But, All uh, right, yeah. well, some some people that we won't see at Anfield unless they come back playing for another club, of course. Uh, Sadio, Divock and Minamino, what do you make of those moves? Well, we I know why Divock and um, uh, Taka have gone. They, they, they weren't getting games and Divock goes and he, uh, he's got a, a cult. He's not a legend. He, he'll be, he's a cult hero. Yeah. Um, what, a, what, a, what, a, what a career it can look back on. You know, it's... It is incredible. I mean, every time you thought he were finished, he'd pop up and score a goal against Everton at the perfect uh, time. Yeah, yeah, you, you know. And I, the the uh, the goal he scored in that last minute when uh, Pickford's arms didn't reach the crossbar. Um, <laughs> it, it, yeah, I still. I, I mean, I I just remember looking at the referee, thinking, "Is he giving it?" And then everyone was going crazy. And of course, Jurgen had run on the pitch. And the similar thing was against Barcelona when he, he scored the fourth and the winning goal. Um, yeah. Again, I, I didn't know whether the referee was going to give it because, you know, you know what Trent had done, it was so quick thinking. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, Divock leaves us with uh, um, so many happy memories. Yeah, you know, he had, he had sometimes when I used to wonder what the hell he was doing on the pitch, but... <laughs> that's that that's unfair he it he, he was it he was pretty it was he had a he can look back and say he had a successful career at liverpool he too has won all the medals going and yeah. uh, or being awarded all the medals going Fantastic. and the hearts of the fans for doing the business at the right time at the crucial times he, he did it yeah. yeah 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 but i say though the goals against everton there was there was a few of them you, you know tr fantastic and uh yeah. Yeah, and everyone is memorable. Every goal against Everton is memorable, but yeah, <laughs> brilliant. I so mean, how and he also he, he also had a bad injury when uh, an Everton player basically went through him uh, and mm. was sent off, and and that that basically made his career. That's when his career stalled. Yeah. But he, he came back, and yeah, you know, fantastic. And how important is the recent news that Mo is staying? Oh, that's. That's just capped off the summer, hasn't it? Really, we we wanted him to stay. I, I don't I don't listen, don't read what's in the paper or on the websites or anything like that. I don't care how much money they're paying him. That that's irrelevant. We just needed him to stay. Yeah. And you you know the on the other side, Sadio's gone. But you you know when Sadio Mane says he want, he wants a new challenge. Why go to Bayern Munich? That's not a challenge. It's, it's a procession there, Lee. You, you, you know. So it's guaranteed. It's guaranteed medals there. But again, you, you know, he, he's he served the club well. Fantastic career um, since he came from Southampton. Jurgen Klopp turned him into a world class footballer. And there was yeah. a time, the the year when we won the league, when I think um, I think he was the best player in the world at that time. Yeah, uh, along yeah. with Mo Salah, but Sadio was, I, I thought, was the best player in the world. Mm. And uh, yeah, it's been a privilege to watch him play. But he's gone now, so I look for the new players. Yeah, well, we got quite a few. Darwin Nunes, what do you know about him? Well, we saw him play for Benfica, scored a couple of goals against us, and uh, Jurgen said he was good looking. So, and I think he meant on the football front. <laughs> So we've we've got him, yeah. There will somebody will come out with a comment. Well, can he do it on a wet night in? I don't know. Um, it used to be Stoke, and then it was Burnley, but that sort of place. Well, maybe we'll find out. But yeah, he, I, I feel um, we've invested in him. He's a young player. He's you know his career's in front of him. Yeah. So unlike uh, other players we've signed who. We're already established. He, he he's got his career in front of him, and uh, we've got the two young lads, um, the the lad from Fulham, the lad from Aberdeen. Well, we'll see what they can bring. You you know, Ramsey they're, they're and Caravello. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're not for today. They're they well, they may be for today. You hope 
the, but uh, they're they're again they're they're players we can build they can work with them, and um, I, I just think the the Jurgen Klopp knows what he's doing with these players, and and hopefully hopefully RV Elliott will be able to recapture that early season form from last year. Yeah. Um, because if it does, then you you know we don't need to sign another midfield player because we've got one. We've yeah. got them. Yeah. <coughs> but what about um, other young players, though? I mean, the likes of Curtis and Nico Williams and that. Uh, what do we have to do to make them stay, or should they stay? I don't, I don't think Nico will be <clears throat> will be staying for, for too much longer. He, I, he's a good player. He's a Welsh international um, in Wales or in the World Cup, along with England. Yeah. The same group, in fact. Um, so yeah, he's a, he's a good player, but he will not replace Curtis. Uh, he will not replace Trent. Yeah. Now for Curtis, I think this is his make or break year. He's got to he's got to come through and make it this season. There's yeah. no doubt about that. Because um, yeah. he's, tw- he's 21 going on 22. You you've got to you've got to make the break at that time. You you know this. He, he could still go and play Premier League football, but not at the we're talking a team that's in the top two, top three, yeah. um, you and, and a, a serious threat in Europe. He's got to be able to play at that level regular. Yeah. yeah. Um, however, I've got a <clears throat> sneaking feeling there's a player lurking in the background that Jurgen likes, and he hasn't spoken too much about him. And that's Tyler Morton. I saw him last season, and yeah, he brings he brings a little bit of attitude on the pitch, which means it's don't mess with me. And right, you know, okay. I've I've just got a feeling he's he he might be uh, lurking in the shadows somewhere around Anfield. Definitely. Okay. If you're watching this live, you know what day it is. If you're not, if this is a recording, fifth of July, twenty twenty two, is when John Pierman picked him as so, as one right. to watch. Yeah. As one to watch. Okay. Yeah. All right. Now I've just been having a look at the new. Um, a way strip for this season. I don't know if you've seen it. Here's a picture of it. Have you yeah. seen this, John? It's a bit trippy, isn't it? it, it it's very, yeah. It's not my <laughs> style. Um, as, uh, well, yeah. I, I, I'm sure I'm sure they will be selling millions around oh, the Oh, I'm world. sure they will. Yeah. yeah. But they won't be selling, not, not, in, uh, not in Griffin Close in Chester. Okay, I wonder if it's a tactical thing to try and daze the opposition or something, to try and hypnotise them or something. It could be. I don't know. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. I, um, I, I'm a traditionalist, Graham. The best, the best away kit was uh, in the um, 80s when it was a, a white shirt, black shorts. Red numbers. Um, yeah, yeah, no no names on the back, no sponsors yeah. on the front. Or yeah. Not all the time. But yeah, they were, that was that was great. Always made made a footballer look good. Yeah, even, even when they weren't. It's just nice and basic. It's just you, you're white yeah. with your black shorts, and you know, I I'm still not used to players not playing in black boots. If I was the manager, I'd I'd make that a rule. <laughs> I, I maybe yeah, red, well, yeah, as yeah, long yeah, as everyone yeah. agreed. But uh, orange and yellow and blue boots. Yeah, uh, multicolored psychedelic. Yeah, <laughs> one boot red, one boot white. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, what about uh, next season, got, John? Well, he's got another pair like that somewhere in the changing room. But, <laughs> that right? Yeah. What about next season, John? What 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 are your hopes for the season? I mean, is is the quadruple? Is it still within reach? Have we got the players to do it? If the if the new players gel, that 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 was a one off. Um, you think? I, 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 yeah, for 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 us, yeah. Um, I, I would say now, Manchester City are firm odds on favourites to win the league um, and I'd be surprised if they didn't that, that's not being pessimistic um, that's a reality of, of the game, they've got the money they're spending big money uh, they signed Haaland they've, they, they, they can just buy, buy players and blow all the teams out of the water, a bit like Chelsea were doing in uh, the early days of Abramovich but um, and they can spend 100 million on a player that doesn't get a regular game yeah. So yeah, you know, there's things like that. But I think we can be competitive. We can be up there again. And I, I do think if you win cups, no matter what the, those cups are, if you win the uh, the two domestic cups, if we if we compete for them again, fine. You you know, day out at Wembley, still still a day out at Wembley. 
and fantastic. So I just I, 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 I will I won't say we're going to win the league because I, I think Manchester City will. Or that that's how it goes. So, we'll, but we'll see. I just think we've got a, a brilliant squad, a brilliant manager. If I, if if I, I would have liked liked us to have signed another midfield player, we still may do. But the chances are, we, the, the the general con, uh, consensus is we won't. But um, yeah, we've we've got a good squad of players, and all I can say is, it'd be great to get back down Anfield, stand outside the ground selling the fanzine and hopefully watching the team win again because okay. we haven't lost the, we haven't lost we haven't lost a home league game in front of spectators for something like four years yeah. <laughs> maybe even longer now I don't know um, but yeah it's amazing we lost games yeah. during the pandemic but everyone was losing games in the pandemic yeah but you, you know some teams lost a lot more than we did and we got vilified for it but we still finished above some of them yeah. so yeah you, you know let's see what happens but you know new season fresh hope and i just hope that all the players are come, come the uh opening game of the season not the charity shield but the opening league game down at full and what a fabulous place to go and play your opening game down by the riverside and a walk through the park to get to the ground <laughs> beautiful <laughs> if it, especially if it's sunny yeah <laughs> so and issue 285 will be out in time for the Community Shield match if you go into that in Leicester, if you can get a ticket. Uh, tell everybody about Red All Over the Land, the the longest-lasting and the only surviving printed Liverpool fanzine. You can you can subscribe, though, can't you, John? And you can get it digitally as well. But the, Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, if, if people want to know a bit more about how to subscribe, the address is in front of them, the website address. Go yeah. to that. Um, it, it'll be out for the charity, sh uh, the community shield, uh, and then the following day, because we play Strasbourg, so it'll be uh, on sale at Anfield. Um, it's been going for 20, uh, 26 years. We're heading up to the November date when it'll be the twenty seventh year. I want to try and get to three hundred. I'm getting old, but I'm going yeah, to try and get two eight five now. Then, yeah, yeah, be nice round see where we are. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this, this next issue has got a lot in about Paris. It's got a lot in about last season. Um, and we want people to not just write for it, we want them to buy it. And the lady in America that you met, uh, you talked about, tell her to get in touch with us. The either at that or at uh, redallovertheland at gmail.com. Right. Um, okay. And that's the same one if you want, if you fancy being an, uh, if you go to the match regularly and you want to be a seller. Of the That's fanzine we as well. We're looking yeah. for sellers. We're looking for new sellers all the time because we feel that people miss out now. The layout of the ground over the last couple of years has changed. Um, we have we only have people dotted around the stadium. We used to have ten to twelve people, maybe even more, selling yeah. the fanzine in the in the early days. We want to get. We can't. We don't expect to get that number back. But yeah, you you know. Manchester United sells something like six thousand copies, yeah, at, uh, of their fanzine. We we're nowhere near that. Okay, all right. But uh, John, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks for for help letting me be part of the Ian Callaghan experience. Is what it was. It was an experience to hang out with him all night for hours and hours and just talk football and memories with him and. It was just lovely. So thanks very much for that. Look forward to doing more of those as well in the future. Yeah. Great. Well, when you think that that night started at six thirty and we were still there at twelve thirty, so, <laughs> we yeah. were, we were, and it he's eighty, and he never flagged at the age of eighty. He never flagged. Yeah. Quite yeah. Right, have. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. What? What? Are you? You're just a youngster, aren't you, John? Oh uh, yeah, just a bit younger than him. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Keep him going. All right. Till next time. Tell your friends about this. Tell them where to find it on YouTube. If you're watching this live, there's and you you know you end up talking to your friends about it, about what Callie said or something. You, the same link that you've got to get to this live version will also take you to the recorded version, unedited, of the whole thing. John Pierman. Until next time, you'll never walk alone. Thank you.